All right. Okay, let's um, let's go to the Lord in prayer and get started. That sounds good. Let's pray. Father, we want to thank you for amazing grace. Father, a grace, Lord, that is so profound and yet so difficult for us to embrace. And yet, God, it is true that your riches have been granted to us in Jesus Christ, that you have blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And Father, I pray today that, Lord, we would expand our understanding of your grace, Lord, not just to the moment-by-moment -moment minutia of life, but, Father, to understand that our salvation has extended all the way into eternity past. Father, that you have foreknown us and you have predestinated us to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ and receive the glory of Jesus Christ as multitudes and many brethren by faith in him. So, God, open our hearts, God, to receive difficult truth, yet, God, a truth that if we will receive it will transform our lives and fill us with joy. Father, we thank you for this time. Bless the preaching of your word. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, we are cruising through Romans chapter 8. We're going to look at chapter 8, verse 26 through 29 today. Uh, just to give context, really we're going to focus on uh, 29 primarily. Um, but um, we've, let, me, let me read this text. I guess that's a good place to start. Just read the text, Ron. Just read the text. Romans chapter 8, 26 through 29. Likewise, the Spirit also helps our infirmities. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit. Because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Now, last week we covered these, these texts here, this passage, and it is so very important that we understand and we let these truths settle deep into our hearts. And the first truth that we want to review from last week is this fundamental truth that the Spirit helps our infirmities. We talked about how we all have infirmity and weakness. Every one of us. We have infirmities weaknesses spiritually and physically the spirit of god helps our infirmities remember the word help was like lifting that gurney and yet i said you know it's, it's a little bit more than that because that's kind of a shared thing and we just don't even have the strength to lift it so the spirit of god lifts it like papa does the grandson's toy papa's mighty arm of strength lifts the the plastic toy that sean can't lift or mckinley so the spirit of god helps us and and lifts the infirmity and helps us through intercessory prayer. It says, we don't know what we should pray for as we ought. I, again, I've shared this. I, I will pray through the Lord's Prayer that's uh, you know, uh, given to us as a template or an example of prayer. And so many times I just stumble and, 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 and hit a wall and it's difficult to pray and to know exactly what to pray for. To pray for one another, to pray for the congregation, and to know specifically, Lord, what are you dealing, Lord, in this circumstance? Now, I will say, going through this series, the Lord has helped me to refocus my prayer, not so much in the sense of, Lord, take away this burden, but God, in the burden that this person may be dealing with, reveal to them, work and, and do the work you have intended through this burden that they're facing. And so it has helped me to shift my prayer life. But, but still, nevertheless, I don't know the things that I should pray for as I ought. It says we ought to. But praise God that he doesn't cast us away. It says, but the Spirit itself makes intercession for us with groanings that cannot be uttered. The point I, I made last week and I want to reemphasize is that the Spirit of God is not waiting for us to pray. 
I've heard this taught so many times that the Spirit of God is just anticipating, waiting for that moment when we will actually eke out our prayer and then He will magnify it with groanings that cannot be uttered to, to the Father. That's not what this text says. It says in the present tense that the Spirit itself is making intercession for us. Constantly, constantly, constantly interceding on our behalf. Now that's very important to know, especially when you tie it in with this other component. Verse 27 says, And he that searches the hearts, is the Father, he knows what is the mind of the Spirit. Because he, the Spirit, oh by the way, that shows that the Holy Spirit is a person. He, oh yeah, by the way, number two, an electrical power or a force does not intercede. <laughs> We're talking about a person, the third person of the Godhead, the Holy Spirit, is a person who intercedes on our behalf. He that searcheth the hearts, the Father searches the hearts, he knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because he, the Spirit, makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. When the Spirit of God prays, he knows exactly what to pray for. His prayer, the Spirit's prayer, intercessory work on our behalf, is always in harmony with the will of the Father, the will of God. Unlike our prayers, which are kind of shotgun scattered, they're not focused, they're, we don't know what we should pray for as we ought. We really should be growing in our prayer life, and I hope that we are. But even if we grow until the last day of our life and our prayer life, we will still not pray in the same manner that the Spirit of God is interceding for us. Number one, with groanings that cannot be uttered, okay, and in accordance with the will of God. So notice this, that the Father, the Father searches the hearts. Do you realize that, that God is searching your heart? God is not impressed with what you do on the outside. God is not impressed today. If you're crafting some form of resume for God to say, Oh God, I went and attended church today. Oh God, I gave so much. Oh God, I said God bless you to someone and encourage them. God is not interested in that. He looks at the heart. He's looking at your heart. So if you do not know Jesus Christ as your Savior, He sees the sin in your heart. He looks. He knows who you really are. He sees through the facade. If you've trusted Jesus Christ, though, He sees the righteousness of His Son imputed to you as a gift, a free gift that comes by faith. Now, as believers... We're here, and he sees our heart. He knows our heart, and he knows all of the weaknesses that we have. He's diagnosed every weakness in our heart. And the Spirit of God comes along, and the Spirit of God assesses the same thing and now intercedes to the Father, and you've got concurrence within the Godhead to develop our welfare, to help us with our infirmities. So now the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, is interceding according to the will of God, and that's important. To know, because we know from 1 John, I shared this last week, chapter 5, we know that if we pray according to his will, he hears us. Number one, God hears us. And number two, we know that we have the request that we've asked of him. So if it's true for us that when we pray in harmony with the will of God, that he will answer exactly what we've prayed, then guess what he does for the Holy Spirit? He constantly answers in the affirmative to the request of the Spirit of God. And so therefore, we come into verse 28. And now we say, it says, And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to His purpose. Because of this truth, we can know that all things work together for good. All things. Now last week I, I touched on this at the very end of the sermon. We didn't really fully develop it as much as I wanted to. But I hope that you can look back in this week now in light of this truth and say, you know, everything that God did, whether it was pleasant or not, or whether I understood it or not, was ordered and ordained by God to come into my life to work for my good. Uh, I, uh, I shared this morning in Sunday school uh, about friends that we have in Panama City, Florida, and the devastation. Uh, this one particular friend uh, uh, has over $50,000 in home damage. There still is no electricity. 
Uh, there is no air conditioning, which is important. Even Panama City this time of year is still important. Uh, it's very humid and muggy. I don't know, maybe in the 80s, the temperature there. Uh, but they have no power. They're, they're putting tarps over their roofs. Uh, they're, they're living by candlelight and flashlight at night. And what was very telling was that uh, the wife of, of, this, of this friend uh, made a post and she was, she was concerned about her father's shed that was destroyed. But she said in the midst of all this, she had peace. And she made the point of saying, it's not that, that, that the Lord has eased the anxiety, it's that, that the anxiety is gone. There is just peace. And their home is the one that suffered over $50,000 worth of damage and still has trees laying in the roof of their home and water damage inside of it. And so you say, well, how can that be? You know, we would pray and say, we would never say, Lord, and this is, again, we pray. We don't know what we took pray for. Lord, I pray that a tree would crush my home. <laughs> and, Father, that you would have the power go out so I would learn how to trust in you even without those things. We would never pray that prayer. But when these things have come through and affected the lives of the saints, we can rest assured and know that somehow God is behind it and that God is working it for our good. Now, this promise is only for the believer. These things work together. The word for work together, it means they work together. <laughs> they cooperate. These circumstances that are unpleasant, they are woven together in our lives. They work together. They cooperate together to produce Christ's likeness in our lives. God has a purpose in the suffering and the trials that we are going through. And we must lay hold upon this truth that God is sovereign. And I want to tell you something. We are on the cusp of economic collapse. We as a congregation and as an American people are soon to face Venezuelan type poverty. It's not a question of if, it is a question of when. And the warning signs are all around us. The problem is we, they don't teach economics anymore. So somehow we think we can live off the credit card for all of our lives and there's no consequence. Well, there is a consequence. And the bills are coming due very, very soon. And so we must prepare ourselves to say, this is not just theoretical. This is truth that we need to anchor our soul to in the times, the difficulties that are coming. And let's say even, let's say it's another another year or so, which I highly doubt. But let's say that it is, and we're still going to have problems in the day. We're still going to have doctor's appointments that don't go the way we thought they would. The test that, hey, when you're young and the tests come back negative and everything's good to go, you're going to have that first positive test, that first somber moment where the doctor walks in and his face is not, he's not smiling. So we need to know that God is sovereign. We can trust in God even in those difficult times. And I thought of Joseph. Remember Joseph? His brothers did him wrong, and he, he didn't ask for this. He'd say, oh, God, I pray that my brothers would first try to kill me, and then that they would change their mind and throw me in a pit and sell me off in slavery. He didn't pray that. But that's exactly what God did to his life. Now imagine if we were thrown in that situation without this knowledge. God help us. I'd be murmuring, complaining. Why'd you do that? Why'd you throw me down here, man? You know, I mean, <laughs> this is just human nature. This is how we'd all respond without the grace of God. And yet, yet Joseph, God, God was doing something in Joseph's life. And I, I recently heard a beautiful uh, explanation of, of all the things that God did through Joseph. That if, if God did not do one, any one of those steps in exalting Joseph to the number two position in Egypt, that we would not be saved today. We would not have salvation. That all of the things that he brought upon Joseph worked around, even to this day, the impact to us is that the Messiah had come. And Israel was preserved because of what God had done in exalting Joseph. Um, but he says, you know, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. You meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. And the problem is we just we're so comfortable in the United States that these things are just theoretical. So God has to He's gonna to have to knead into the dough some suffering into our lives that we'll begin to really believe the truths here that are before us. 
But we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. So this is for the body of Christ. This is for those who've placed their faith in Jesus Christ. Um, this is not just for, for everyone. So please do not take this verse to an unbeliever and say, oh, you know, pat their little hands say, God works all things together for good. So well, it's only true for the body of Christ. It's not true for the unbeliever. Okay, so what the unbeliever needs is the gospel. When God brings a calamity and he spares their life out of his long suffering and graciously preserves their life, they need to hear the gospel. We need to bring that gospel of good news to them. But for us, we understand that in the circumstances of life, <clears throat> all things work together for good. And I've talked about what good is. It's making us like Jesus Christ. Now, we, we have it different. And I mentioned this before last week. We pray for happiness. And God, the intercessor of the Spirit, is praying for holiness. He's praying for holiness. We're praying for happiness. And that's why there's a lot of clash a lot of times when the things that the Spirit of God has requested into our lives... We say, oh, no, 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 God, that's not what I pray for. And we pray against the Spirit because we don't know what we should pray for. In our heart, we, we want happiness. We want contentment. We want health, physical health, and so forth. <clears throat> uh, John 17, 17, we talked about last week. Jesus Christ is interceding. So, by the way, go read John chapter 17 and see what the Spirit of God is praying for because this is what the Son of God prayed for us. And so guess what? The Spirit of God, the Son of God, and the Father, they're one, and they're in harmony in what they desire for God's children. But notice this. He says, Jesus is praying to the Father. He's interceding on behalf of the disciples, and, uh, in particular, and in general, the body of Christ, those who believe upon him. He says, sanctify them. This is the request of Jesus Christ to the Father. It's not make them wealthy. It is not give them healthy bodies, strength, and number of days. He says, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. The word sanctify means to set apart. And so the process here, God is, the Son is praying to God the Father and saying, Father, set these men apart. What does that mean? Separate them out of the world. As I, as I thought about this, I thought Christ is speaking, saying, remove Adam, pull everything that's Adam out of them, and replace it with me. This is the work, the process of purification and sanctifying. Setting it apart. Now think about unclean water that has not been filtered, and clean water. Clean water is one. There are no impurities. There are no poisons in it. But the unclean water has all sorts of contaminants and poisons in it. And it must go through a purifying process before it can be consumed. And so God is taking our lives. Now, he's imputed the righteousness of Christ to us. That's been done the moment we believed on Jesus Christ. We have eternal life. But now he's in the process of catching up our day-to-day -day walk with who we really are in Christ. And so he brings in these circumstances and he brings in people and he brings in wisdom and he teaches us really what he's doing in his circumstances is he's showing us our weakness because we don't see it. We think that we've got it all together. And even when we think we, no, I recognize my weaknesses. No, you don't really recognize your weaknesses. So he brings in circumstances that magnify our weaknesses. So this is the sanctification process. As I thought this through, <clears throat> I come up, came up with a six-step process of, of, of the intercessory work of the Spirit in sanctification. It begins, number one, with our weakness. It begins with our weakness, our infirmity. Number two, the Spirit intercedes and responds to help us with our infirmity. So the Spirit of God is responding, and this is part of that sanctifying process. The Spirit is interceding. Even now as we're praying, or as, as, as we're talking and meditating on the Word of God, the Spirit is interceding for all of us. We don't know what the afternoon holds for us. But whatever comes will be because, be because of the intercessory work of the Spirit of God to sanctify us. Number three, the event or circumstance comes into our life, the thing... The, the thing that we can know is for our good, that comes into our life experientially. 
Number four, it magnifies our weakness. And number five, when we have our weakness magnified, we're humbled, we begin to confess and appeal to God for power. Now remember last week, I read the scripture about the Apostle Paul. He had the thorn in the flesh. And he said, he learned, when I'm weak, then I'm strong. He learned that through suffering. And so then it changed his attitude. He repented and he rejoiced in his infirmities because he recognized that his infirmities were opportunities for the power of Christ to be manifest in his life. So we confess, we appeal for power, and then the miracle, the transformation of, begins to occur. When we confess and appeal to, for God's power, then God responds with miracle transformation. So this is the sixth step that, that I saw as I meditate on this in our lives in the process of sanctification. And oh, by the way, it is when our weakness is magnified that we begin to pursue the Word of God. You know, when, when the boys were so sick with epilepsy, it drove me into the Scriptures. I wanted to know what is going on. God, why are my children suffering? God, why won't you bring healing? And it drove me into the Scriptures, and the Scriptures revealed more of the character of God and what was going on in their suffering. And that is the intent. When we are suffering, we're in intense pain or, and our weakness is being magnified. Open the scriptures and ask, cry out to God for a word of wisdom from the scriptures. And he will grant it. He will honor that prayer. Uh, in the process, I'll just share this with, with the situation with Stephen. I don't know if he's left or not, but um, I've shared this before. Uh, he was on, the, on, on death's door. And I was crying out to God, and I didn't understand why this was happening. Because again, my prayers for happiness. I'm, I'm a father, and white picket fence, and happy little kids that grow up and have happy families with happy little kids. That, that was the illusion that I was under. Okay, let me just shatter that illusion. That's, that's not reality. That's fa fantasy, fairy tale. God said, I'm going to let you smell, some, smell the coffee of reality. So I thought Stephen was going to die. The doctor told us, have you made plans for his future? And so I drove into the word of God. I drew near to God through this crisis. And God gave me the passage out of John chapter 3. Or excuse me, John chapter 11. In dealing with um, Lazarus. John 3. Three, the Lord gave me this verse, a rhema verse. It said, Therefore his sisters, Lazarus' sisters, sent unto Jesus, saying, Lord, behold, he whom thou lovest is sick. And that leapt out, and, and that God loved my son, Stephen. And that this was a prayer. And I said, Lord, he whom thou lovest is sick. And I put his picture on the door, and I put this verse underneath it. And here's what Jesus said. Jesus heard that. He said, This sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. And God healed Stephen. God gave me a word of healing from the Scriptures, and I clung to that. Now, I wish I could say I was uh, fully assured of it, because I wasn't. My flesh wrestled. Is he going to be healed or not? I don't know. But God gave me that word, and God miraculously healed our son. Okay, So that's what I'm talking about. When you get into that crisis moment, circumstances begin to bind upon you, and you're in that narrow way of tribulation, that's the time to cry out. When did the Israelites cry out? Okay, um, here's the Red Sea, okay, and there's the Egyptian army. It's time to cry out. <laughs> Only I think they murmured, <laughs> and God still loved them, and Moses interceded, and they went through... They went through the Red Sea as though it was dry land. See, God is waiting to do great miracles if we'll trust him in those times of crisis. So 1721, it says, the, the point is that they all may be one as thou, Father, art in me and I in thee, that they also may be one in us. That's what God is doing to make us one in Christ. That the world may believe that thou hast sent me. I read that today and I thought, you know what? God's objective is for this oneness to be really developed while we're still in this world. 
so that the world can see and they'll hear our testimony and they'll see our, our lives and the unity of the body of Christ. You say, we're all one, man. They're all the same. There's no schism or fraction or brokenness or disagreement. And boy, can we see how Satan has really tried to thwart that. Well, you know what? His efforts are going to be futile because God is going to fulfill the prayer of his son on this behalf. We will be one in Christ because God has interceded. Jesus has interceded to the Father, and it's the will of the Father. That's our future. Now we pick up today with verse 29. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Now we're going to deal with the, the uh, sticky issue of foreknowledge, the foreknowledge of God. We're going to see what's called the golden chain of salvation, and it begins with God's foreknowledge in eternity past, and it ends with our eternal glory in the very presence of God because of Jesus Christ. But let's begin with this word, for whom he did foreknow, he did also predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son. So that's truth number 50. Whom he did foreknow. Well, the word for foreknow is progenosco. And guess what? It means to know beforehand. To know beforehand. Now, there's a lot of debate about this. And I'm just going to cut to the chase. The problem with the reason we kind of bristle at the foreknowledge of God in, in, in terms of election or choosing us is because we cling tenaciously out of pride to say, I have to have some sort of contribution to my salvation. And even good theologians and teachers will say, well, God foreknew. And what that meant was he looked down the corridor of time. He said, oh, Ron Tabor will believe when he's 16. Okay, I, I'm going to predestinate him. Oh, here's someone else. They believe too. I'm going to predestinate them. That's not what it means. God foreknew us. He knew us. Let's develop this. Notice what it says here. Whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son. Now, if foreknowledge is simply like, yeah, I know God, I'm God. I, I know everybody. I foreknow everyone. I know exactly what you do. I know exactly what you do. You're going to believe. You're not going to believe. You're not going to believe. You're going to believe. If that's the case, then this verse could not be true. For whom he did foreknow, he did also predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son. We know that the unbeliever who dies in unbelief is not conformed to the image of his son. They're going to be cast in the lake of fire. So what this means is God has known you before God had created you. And, and let this sink into your mind and be a mind-warping experience. There was never a point in eternity past where God's like, I think I want to create something. Yeah, that's a good idea. God doesn't have ideas. God only has his will. He never gets an idea. Hey, how about we create some creatures? They'll rebel and we save them. What do you think? Yeah, that's a good idea. No. It's not how God operates. God acts upon his infinite knowledge of all things. He is sovereign God. And so his foreknowledge is, I have chosen, I'll just use Ron Tabor because I know me best. I have known Ron Tabor from all, I've always known Ron Tabor. Always. And you know what I'm going to do with Ron Tabor? I'm going to bring glory to my name. I'm going to make him a vessel of mercy. He never came like, what do we do with Ron? Okay, Ron Tabor. He's going to be a sinner. Okay. What is Vessel of mercy, vessel of wrath. Which one? Okay, vessel of mercy, one, two. All right, I'll carry it. Vessel. No. <laughs> God has known me forever. And he has had a purpose to make me, to create me, to manifest his glory, to make me a vessel of mercy. You know that day the pastor came to my house? I didn't want to hear about Jesus. I didn't want to hear about God. I wanted him to shut his mouth do his blessing, say his prayer, and get out of there because I wanted to go party some more, man. But that's not what God who foreknew me from eternity past said. At this time, you will be my child. You will be born again. I didn't know that. 
thought it was going to be religious chat and scat, man. <laughs> scat man do. I was born again. I, God revealed his son at that moment at the appointed time. It's his sovereignty. He foreknew me. Folks, it's a liberating doctrine. It's not a, a binding doctrine. It's liberating. If God has foreknown us, you think we're going to stumble and fall out of his grace? From eternity past, he knew all the rotten things I would do, and he still has chosen me as a vessel of mercy? I can't escape that grace. We were singing the amazing grace. Let me, let me pull it up here. Let me find that verse. It really leapt out at me. Um, uh, what page was that on? 293. 293. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, listen to this. How precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed. <clears throat> what I didn't know when I was 16 was that God's grace had been treasured up for me from all eternity past. But it was manifest at my dinner table when I was 16. How precious did that grace appear. Oh, Lord, the hour. And really, it's the second I first believed. It became manifest to me. I understood God has saved me. I didn't understand the theology. I didn't fully understand the theology of amazing grace. But his grace was manifest to me at that moment. But it had been preserved. The reservoir of infinite grace was given to me before the world began. He foreknew me. So let's look at some passages here. Uh, Galatians chapter 4, verses 8 and 9. Uh, let's see. Galatians 4, 8 and 9. Now listen to this. It says, How be it then, when ye knew not God, in other words, from a human perspective, there was a time, Paul's writing, when you didn't know God, when ye knew not God, what was your behavior like? Well, you did service unto them which by nature are no gods. So when you don't know who God is, you make things your gods. You make an idol. Maybe you make money your god. You make whatever. You will substitute something for the true and living God. It says, when you did not know God, you did service unto them which by nature are no gods. Now listen to this. But now, after that you have known God, or rather are known of God, now he rebukes them. How turn ye again to the weak and beggarly elements whereunto you desire again to be in bondage? He's rebuking the, the, the Galatian believers because they have come to the knowledge of God. And now with this, this wonderful treasure of the knowledge of the true and living God, they said, well, that's good, but i, I got to go back to this thing and all this stuff and the, and the hamada hamadas and all this stuff and go to church on Saturday and do, do, do. i got to please God. Well, wait a minute. Time out. Why are you going back to all that garbage? When you have the knowledge of God now. See, before they didn't know God, and now they do know God. But guess what? It says, oh, rather, you are known of God. So this is the interesting thing. From a human perspective, in my life and in your life, if you know Jesus Christ in truth, there was a time before when I didn't know God. But he knew me. I didn't know him, but he knew me. And I didn't know that he knew me because I didn't know him. And then there came a day when God said, okay, right now, bring the preacher here. He orchestrated it. Do, do, do. Naughty Ronnie will bring the pastor in. He'll be grounded. It'll bring the pastor in. He'll be willing. Otherwise, he wouldn't be willing. He's got to be grounded and punished for his discipline, for his transgression. He'll bring the pastor in. He's going to speak these words to him. And when he speaks that word, I'm going to lift the veil on Jesus Christ. He's going to see it. He's going to have eternal life. He's going to know me. And I've known him forever. He's been in my heart from eternity past. But he's going to know me this night. So there was a time when I didn't. But now there's a time that I do. And guess what? I'm going to know God forever. Okay? This is the important thing. So this, that's for, for the believer. Now listen to this in Matthew 7, 22 and 23. And it's on the judgment day. This is a scene, a terrifying scene out of the judgment day. Jesus says, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils? And in thy name done many wonderful works? 
And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Now, if the word foreknowledge simply means well, God just knows everybody, he just knows everybody, and God, because he's God, he knows everything and he knows everybody, then how can Jesus, who is God, say, I never knew you? What do you mean? God, God you formed him in the womb of his mother. How can you say you did not know him when you formed him? It's because he does not know him in a saving way. He's not mine. That's not my sheep. I know my sheep. That one's not mine. In fact, it's not a sheep. It's a goat. So he says, I never knew you. Now, as I read this through, I was thinking, um, wow. Notice this. He says, many will say to me in that day that there's going to be actual debate with Jesus Christ at the judgment seat. And as I read this, I thought, this really actually sounds like a defense. It seems as though the books have been opened at this point. The indictment has been read. All of the wickedness of the people has been documented in the books. Their sins were never forgiven in Jesus Christ. And so the books are open. Their deeds are announced before the judgment seat of Jesus Christ. The book of life is opened up. Their name is not in the book of life. And it's looking pretty grim. And now they open up and say, Lord, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute. Don't you remember? Have we not prophesied in thy name? Lord, wait, wait, wait. Have we, have, we not, have we not cast out devils? I cast out a devil. I went, this lady was in our religion, and I went to her house and, and did the iggity oggity ook in Jesus' name, and, and, and she seemed to get better. Didn't, Lord, I did that. And Lord, Lord, didn't I do? There's just many wonderful works. You didn't talk about those things, God. It seems as though they're trying to make a defense. Lord, I went to Grace Bible Ministries. I sat there through hours of preaching. I was so tired I fell asleep. And I got frustrated and I hated to stay there, but I wanted to please you. God, remember hours. I logged hours in those chairs. And that count for something. Well, here's what Jesus says we can know in advance. I will profess to them, I never knew you. Depart from me. Ooh. Depart from me. Depart from me. The world today says, I don't need your Jesus. I don't need salvation. I'm fine. And then God says, you fool. Today your soul is required of you. And again, I've, I've talked about this. In this life, you know, if I want my consciousness, my soul to be in this room, then I say it'll be in this room. If I want it to be in the bathroom to go take care of business, then I will take my consciousness into, my, into the bathroom. And when we leave here and I want my consciousness to be in front of a TV and watch a football game, eat the pizza and then take my nap, well, I decide that. My consciousness is there. But there will be a day when God says, oh, no, 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 no. You're going to go somewhere where you don't want to go. Your consciousness will not submit to your will anymore. Your consciousness will be taken from this place. And you will stand before God. If you do not know Jesus Christ, you will stand before God and you will give account for everything you've done, thought, or said. And you'll have no choice in the matter. You'll say, oh, uh, hold on, Lord, I'm going to go to the bathroom. No, heaven and earth have fled away. There's no place. There's no bathroom break here. You're going to stand before God. You're going to give an account. And he's going to profess, if you're there at that point, I never knew you depart from me. And your soul will not be filled with joy, be filled with the terror of the Lord, the horror, the reality, the sobering truth that your consciousness and your spirit will be violently cast into the lake of fire to be tormented forever and ever and ever. And the smoke of your torment will ascend forever. Salvation is essential. Today is the day of salvation. Today. Believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. And guess what? You'll find out like I did when I was 16. God's known me forever. Praise God. So he doesn't know. That, that's the truth. He either has known you forever or he has never known you. Well, how do I tell which one it is? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. That's how you tell 
believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. That's how you tell if he's known you forever or if he doesn't know you. That's the test. I thought of Jeremiah. He was an example of this. Listen to this, what God says about Jeremiah. Here's a word. Before, okay, before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. Well, that's good to know, <laughs> right? Before I formed thee in the womb, I knew thee. Whoo, praise God, you know me. Before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee. And I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. I love this because look what he says here. He says, uh, before being conceived, he didn't say, about 20 trillion years before you were conceived, I knew you. No, it's before you were conceived. How far back? Before. All the way back. Before you were conceived, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. I knew thee. That's the first thing. Before you came into existence, I knew you. Number two, he says, I sanctified you. Before you were even conceived, I sanctified you. And the word sanctified in the Hebrew is to be made clean. The will of the Father for Jeremiah was that I knew you and I have chosen to make you clean. Why? Why did God do that? Because the third step, I have ordained thee. I have made you. I've, I've sanctioned your path. I've made you a prophet unto the nations. So he decreed and he established the reality that Jeremiah, this man whom he would create, would be sanctified, cleansed, and made fit for a certain work, and that is the work of a prophet. He wasn't going to be a seamstress. He wasn't going to be a musician. He was going to be a prophet to foretell the word of God. And here's the scope of his impact to the nations, a prophet to the nations. Well, here we are, Gentiles in Ogden, Utah, in the year 2018, and we can read the prophetic word of this man, Jeremiah, ordained a prophet to the nations. He is an example of that, but God has foreknown us. If you know Jesus Christ, you have been known by the Father in eternity past in a saving way. And we see that again because he says, whom he did foreknow, he does something to everyone he foreknows. He also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son. Now this next word, we'll finish up on this point here. We are predestinated. Oh, I don't like that. Really? You don't want the destiny that God has for you? You want to choose your own destiny? Is that what you're saying? I don't like that God has predestinated me. I don't. And here's the other one that gets me. Well, what are we, just some robot? Am I just God's robot? I thank God I'm his robot. I rejoice I'm his robot, if that's the word you want to use. Because guess what? I love my life. I love my God. I love the future that this robot has. I'm going into glory. <laughs> And it's me. So whatever you want to call that, whatever you call it, oh, I'm a robot. You want to rebel against God's will? Is that what you're saying? Because there's a place for those who rebel against God's will. Amen. You want to go there? You're free to. You can. Thank God I'm a predestined robot of grace. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus, for choosing me because I would have nothing to do with you. Amen. I would go into the lake of fire with a fist shaking. I won't be your robot as I'm screaming and wailing and torment, gnashing of teeth, the smoke of the torment ascending. Thank God he reached down and took me. Think about it. We pray, oh God, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. When you pray that prayer, you're asking God, please change my will. When you pray for someone's salvation, you're saying, God intervened in their will. Make them to believe they don't understand. So praise God, he has predetermined my destination. I'm going to heaven. Because of Jesus Christ and the predestination of my Father, I cannot be lost. Are you getting the picture here that this is bigger than just, oh, I had a bad day, I used the F word. Oh my. I said the F bomb. I don't know if I'm saved, Pastor. Pastor, I said the F bomb. I used it twice. And I didn't read my Bible. And I, I do all these other things. Oh, get the big picture, guys. 
He has foreknown you from eternity past. He's predestined you. Now, am I encouraging the F-bomb use? No, please, I'm not. We will chat in my office if I hear you use it. I will chastise you. Okay, that's the, the filth of our own heart coming out of our mouth. But thank God my eternal destination is not based on how frequently or unfrequently I use the F word. I have a Savior that's greater than my tongue's ability to sin. The blood of Jesus Christ has dealt with all of my sin. God has ensured that there is no way I can be lost because he has loved me with an everlasting love. He has foreknown me. He has predestined me to glory. And may I, I'm, I'm going to leave here. Look, I'm like everyone else. Oh, man, I, I, flat tire. Man, this is a bad time for a flat tire. Wait a minute, did you just preach that everything came from the will of God for you? Why aren't you rejoicing, pastor? <laughs> See, the standard's a little higher here. Oh, I guess i got to rejoice in this. But when we understand this, and folks, we are going to face, there are going to be very, very serious times. Let's say that the, the economic collapse doesn't happen for another five years, which is uh, it's not going to be that long. But... You know what? We're going to face that moment of death. If the Lord tarries, we're going to face that moment of death. And that's more terrifying than any, uh, you know, my dollar is worthless and I, you know, I don't know where I'm going to live. Death, that moment we face death, you want to know. You don't want to be guessing what your destination is. And part of the comfort and the assurance and the joy and the victory we have is that we have been predetermined, predestined to eternal life. Okay? And that's something that we can rejoice in and not be angry about. All right, let's pray. Father God, thank you for calling me, for, for foreknowing me, for predestinating me, for calling me, for justifying me. And Lord, the promise that you will glorify me. And oh God, how I, I, I stand in amazement, Lord, that, that a person such as I can, can stand in your presence in full glory and you're not shaking your head in discouragement or disgust against me, Lord, that you will welcome me as you would welcome Jesus Christ because I am his brother and I've been clothed in his righteousness. And I'm his brother not because, because of some uh, eternity past um, uh, pre-mortal existence, God. I'm his brother because I've been adopted into the family of God through faith in Jesus Christ. And Lord, you're going to perfect and you're going to complete the work that you began in me. That wonderful day, God, as a punk and rebel at 16, you lifted the veil on Jesus Christ and transformed my life and gave me a hope and a future and the knowledge of God, which is eternal life. God, I pray today that this message would resonate in our hearts and encourage our walk as we move forward into a new week. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.